Tim and Kyle for arranging this and the, uh, the Berkeley Center and its religious, pro pro uh, religious freedom program for hosting it. Uh, I might mention that uh, when you asked about Mary Dyer, one, she may have known anyway, but one reason that Nina mentioned on page 231 of uh, the book Silence. So uh, as sort of the last example of execution in North America for blasphemy. Uh, the book Silenced, roughly the first half covers the Muslim majority world, the second half deals with the UN and, develop and developments in the West. Neil and I will divide the labor. I will concentrate on Muslim majority countries and she, she will concentrate on attempts to export these restrictions in the Western world. <clears throat> what is it we're talking about? Uh, we use terms such as defamation of religion and blasphemy. Those will be the two major ones I use. But we're using these as shorthand for several dozen categories often used very loosely. Uh, none of the countries we looked at tend to use these terms very precisely or consistently, and many of them don't have much of a foundation of family history. But a partial list of the sort of hurting Muslims' feelings, creating confusion amongst Muslims, imitating Christians, dissension from religious dogma, propagation of spiritual liberalism, apostasy. We will just use blasphemy or insulting Islam as proxy terms for the whole. Um, often the particular charge is called, in some cases, the statute, as in Pakistan or Iran, but commonly it, it is called from a local version of Sharia or another authority. It, take one example in the case of Yusuf Manakani, uh, currently under sentence of death in Iran for apostasy. Uh, the court simply referred to the writings of the late Ayatollah Khomeini, where he said that an apostate should be killed, and therefore we should kill him. So um, the legal, when the state action, the legal sources, again, can be heard. So that's a broad term, what we're talking about. The kinds of repression are many, but basically uh, twofold. Uh, there is repression carried out by states, Saudi Arabia, Maldives, Algeria, Iran, uh, Egypt, and several dozen others. In other cases, there are accusations, sometimes stoked by governments, uh, but sometimes sort of arising um, after uh, an accusation or a uh, mob attack so that there are attacks on those accused of one of these offenses by mobs or vigilantes or terrorists. Many more people are killed and injured by social violence than by direct state action. But very often we see uh, government inability or refusal to stop that violence. Take one example, August the 1st, 2009, <clears throat> after allegations which prove false, that a Quran had been torn, a 1,000 strong mob believed to be connected to the Taliban rampaged through Christian neighborhoods in Punjab, killing seven people, including two children. Uh, Pakistani police did not intervene. They stood aside while this went on. And in Pakistan, as you probably know, which has some of the most draconian blasphemy laws in the world, nobody has ever actually been executed under those laws. Uh, but dozens of people have died they died in prison or on the way to prison or were killed by mobs. So even in Pakistan, it's the extra legal violence um, which is often uh, the worst factor. Uh, who tend to be the victims? Um, uh, the victims can be classified under four categories. Uh, not all fit precisely in them, but to, uh, this would give a rough subdivision. Uh, one group of victims, numbering in the millions, is what I'll call post-Islamic religions, a lot of it, um, but I have in mind particularly Baha'is and Ahmadis. Uh, they are illegal in many, uh, at least in an organized fashion, illegal in many Muslim countries, can be condemned en masse as de facto heretics, as insulted as it sold as Islam, and are subject to discriminatory and brutal laws pervasive state extra legal violence and attack by mobs. Uh, this is true even in comparatively moderate places such as Indonesia, where Ahmadis have been beaten to death. Um, it's on YouTube. Um, the Baha'i leadership in Iran is, is currently in prison and there's no penalty in that country. 
country uh, for killing a Baha'i. Uh, also, taking Pakistan as an example, if you go to the website of the Pakistani embassy uh, here in, um, in Washington, D.C., and you go to the form uh, which you have to fill out to get a passport, it requires you to denounce and reject the Almaty, the Caddy office. That is a condition, if you're a Muslim, for getting a Pakistani passport. So there is the sort of post-Islamic religions. Secondly, those who leave Islam for another religion, either as a convert or become atheists or sort of lapse in their beliefs, um, they can face similar persecution. Again, in, in most of the countries we, we covered, which was about 25, um, in 95% of those, there's persecution of those who leave Islam. In maybe the starkest example, in Somalia, the Al Shabaab militias are systematically killing every Christian in the, in the areas they control on the grounds that they are, if they're Somalis, they are necessarily apostates. A third group is Muslims of, I'll say, of the wrong type or in the wrong place. Egypt has imprisoned and tortured people for being, quote, under the influence of Shia ideas. Saudi Arabia also discriminates against Shiites and more than discrimination against uh, Ismailis. Iran suppresses Sunnis and Sufis. Differing from the version of Islam propagated by government religious authorities can be very dangerous. The fourth category, and the one to which I will devote uh, most time, is Muslim religious and political reformers and dissidents. This is what first caught our attention in the genesis of this book, that uh, very often other problems in the Muslim majority world cannot be addressed because addressing them can be forbidden under the sort of strictures we apply. So authors, journalists, democracy activists, uh, <coughs> Muslims who question repressive interpretations of Islam or advocate Islam for freedom <coughs> may be jailed or killed. <coughs> this has sweeping since Islam is a complex belief system shaping about 1.6 billion followers in culture, politics, economics, science, and education, <coughs> then <coughs> if discussion of various forms of Islam and interpretations of Islam is forbidden, then a large body of ideas in culture, politics, economics, science, and education is no longer open to debate and inquiry. <coughs> <clears throat> the result is, as the late President Wahid of Indonesia uh, said in, he wrote forward to silence, coercively applied blasphemy laws narrow the bounds of acceptable discourse, not only about religion, but about vast spheres of life, literature, science, and culture in general. It needs to be added that governments also deliberately manipulate outrage over perceived insult and criticism. Nina will address this little more in the Western context. Of course, the anger felt by ordinary Muslims when their beliefs are mocked is very real. But very often the charges are politically channeled by authoritarian rulers to maintain their position. Just some examples in this, this fourth category um, of various types of Muslims repressed in this way. Uh, amongst feminists, for example, Taslima Nazreen had to flee Bangladesh for her life because of her writings were accused of being against Islam. Or Malaysia now bans books by the Muslim feminist organization, Sisters in Islam. We also banned books by me, by the way, and John Esposito. Um, uh, amongst novelists, many examples can be given. The most striking is the late Egyptian Nobel Prize winner in literature, Naguib Mahfouz, who had many of his, his novels banned on the grounds that they were against Islam. And he lived under constant protection after being stabbed by a young Islamist leaving him partly paralyzed. Uh, amongst journalists, Afghan Shia scholar Ali Mahakat Nassab, the editor of Women's Rights magazine, was imprisoned by the Karzai government for publishing both un-Islamic articles which criticized stoning as a punishment for adultery or the death penalty 
or apostasy. Amongst clerics, um, Iranian Mohsen Kadivar was in prison for publishing untruths and disturbing public minds. How had he done this? He wrote a dense three-volume work, The Theories of the State in Shiite Jurisprudence, arguing that the Ayatollah Khomeini's teaching of the guardianship of the jurist had no foundation in Shiite jurisprudence. This was a you know, fundamentally Shiite work by a pious, thoughtful Muslim. But it disagreed with Khomeini. So he's publishing untruths. And again, what you often have is the regime will identify itself with Islam. So you differ from the regime, you're against Islam. Or again, in Iran, <coughs> Ayatollah Borajerdi was in prison for arguing similarly to uh, uh, Karabakh that political leadership by clergy is contrary to Islam. Well, Afghans, Gal Zalmai and Mushtaq Ahmad, Ahmad were sentenced to 20 years in prison for publishing a diary translation of the Quran. Um, the Afghan minister of the Hajj described it as the work as a conspiracy of international Zionism, and the chair of the investigating commission on the translation maintained that the writers and editors were members of a religious pluralism movement in the West. As you know, there are restrictions on translations of the Quran, or can you translate the Quran? Uh, but the offense was, again, uh, pious men seeking a translation in Dari, which is what they spoke. Uh, political reformers, uh, Saudi Arabia has uh, imprisoned democracy activists for using un-Islamic terminology, which would translate as the words democracy and human rights, when they petitioned the king for a written constitution. Bangladeshi Sahladeen Shadri was in prison for hurting religious feelings because he advocated peaceful relations between Bangladesh and Israel. And uh, one example I think you would all know, uh, this year Salman Tazir, uh, who was the governor of Pakistan's Punjab province, by far the largest province in the country, was murdered by one of his guards who deemed him a blasphemer because he called the abolition of Pakistan's blasphemy. And here we see the sort of circularity to which we allude. Uh, the law forbids criticism or dissent from the law. So it, it's a ratcheting effect. Um, so, and then the judge who sentenced the, uh, the killer of Kazir himself has had to flee Pakistan on the ground. The sense of the death of a killed by FEMA is something close to the And then if you defend the judge, you may. So there is this sort of ongoing uh, chain of events that you cannot, that becomes very difficult to break. As Tazir's daughter said, um, he called for an abolition of the war, and she said, this is a warning to every liberal in Pakistan. Shut up or be shot. And one could give many hundreds of other examples. To conclude, one result of this is, as the UN Arab Human Development Report is a common thing, this is just on the Arab world now, not the Muslim world in general. In Arab countries where the political exploitation of religion has intensified, tough punishment for original thinking, especially when it opposes the prevailing powers, intimidates and crushes scholars. When politics and religion are intertwined, as they necessarily are in debates about blasphemy and insulting Islam, then without religious debate and critique, there can be no political as Nasser Abu Zaid, driven out of Egypt by Islamists, who counts also in silence, charges of apostasy and blasphemy are key weapons in the fundamentalist arsenal, strategically employed to prevent reform of Muslim societies, and instead confine the world's Muslim population to a bleak, colorless prison of socio-cultural and political conformity. Thank you.
Muslim blasphemy rule came at a precise moment. It was on February 14, 1989, when Iran's Ayatollah Khomeini called for, quote, all zealous Muslims to execute quickly wherever they find them. The British novelist Salman Rushdie and his collaborators on the book, uh, Satanic Verses. Khomeini wanted to ensure that, quote, no one will ever dare to insult Islamic <coughs> sanctity ever again. As Iran's highest official, he also needed to shore up his political legitimacy following the devastating and inconclusive war with Iraq. Khomeini <coughs> spearheaded a religious trend with political undertones propelled by a zeal not seen in the West for several centuries. This came just at a time when blasphemy laws to protect Christianity had all but died out. This push was soon taken up by Sunni powers, largely acting within the Saudi-based Organization of Islamic Cooperation, whose charter commits it to, quote, combat defamation of Islam, and the action plan calls for, quote, deterrent punishment by all states to counter, quote, Islamophobia. The Saudi-based OIC and its 56 member states gave the anti-blasphemy movement weight and traction and ensured it couldn't be marginalized as a fringe element. Within the past uh, 13 years in the UN, the OIC had successfully pushed uh, resolutions for a new human rights for protecting religion, i.e. Islam, from defamation. So while the Universal Declaration for Human Rights protected individual rights to religious freedom, the right to choose and practice a religion or no religion at all, the OIC reinterprets it to mean respect for religion itself, specifically Islam and everything Islamic. As Paul described, the definition of Muslim blasphemy is amorphous, as are the terms Islamophobia, religious insult, and negative stereotypes. And so what is now being demanded of the West is very poorly understood here. Uh, keep in mind that Western countries already make discrimination, religious discrimination, and incitement to violence against uh, people, including Muslims, on the basis of their religion, um, already crimes. They're, these are already crimes. So this is something in addition to that, something new. Uh, this movement would compel Westerners to refrain, refrain from burning the Koran and drawing irreverent cartoons, but it would also mean banning and punishing all critical analysis and debate about and within Islam. The OIC expects secular Western states to regulate speech on behalf of Islam in a way they no longer do for Christianity or any other body of ideas, in a way that is analogous practices in OIC countries themselves. So overall, there has been decades-long multi-party campaign combining international lobbying and a range of other tactics. From its onset, outset, the movement to universalize Islamic blasphemy codes has been accompanied by violence and intimidation. Rushdie and his partners have been stalked by assassins in at least seven countries, resulting in five of them and 41 innocent bystanders being murdered or maimed. Worldwide riots in 2006 against the Danish cartoons and the Pope's 2006 Regensburg, Regensburg speech drove home the point. And you know, just a little footnote: focus. Uh, I ask you to focus on the Regensburg speech. That was an academic lecture given by the head of the Catholic Church in a university setting to an academic audience, the faculty of sciences. The Pope himself holds a chair in theology at Regensburg. And um, uh, it was commenting on a theological uh, discussion of the nature of God from the history of the Catholic Church point of view. Um, that was um, resulted in uh, the killing of a nun in Somalia, Sister Leonella, um, the killing of a Orthodox priest in Iraq, blowing up a church in Iraq, and several in Gaza, and so forth. Um, linked to his speech. Um, just recently, we saw the French satirical magazine, um, Charlie Hebdo, uh, blown up for a satirical issue commenting on the um, the uh, Islamist rise to power in the, in the Arab world. Uh, in the West, 
Also, Muslim reformers have been threatened with death, uh, requiring some to go into hiding, others to obtain 24 hours protection, and others to go silent. Many of them for defending women's rights, others for supporting individual rights and freedom. Uh, these are the ones seeking to reconcile Islam with the pluralistic modern world. They are the reformers, the very people needed to defeat ideological extremism. They include a Danish MP, um, who was, uh, who's, uh, was threatened uh, with surveillance tape caught, um, an imam uh, plotting to blow him up. This is the same imam that instigated a major role in instigating the car Danish cartoon riot. A Somalian Dutch MP was threatened, uh, a Moroccan Belgian senator who criticized the radical influence of the mosques and then was threatened with ritual slaughter, a Congolese Swedish cabinet minister, a Turkish Green Party MP, a Moroccan Italian MP, Azra Nomani, a wealthy journalist from West Virginia who received death threats after calling for an end to gender segregation in American mosques, Kali Duran who received a death threat in Bethesda, Maryland for writing a book, Abraham's Children, explaining Islam for the American Jewish Committee. And the list goes on. Many Western leaders are working to accommodate Muslim blasphemy demands um, instead of resisting this. They're using a patchwork of revived and expanded blasphemy laws, public order offenses, and laws punishing religious and racial hate speech. The latter of which being as undefined as the Muslim blasphemy laws themselves and thus serving as perfect proxies for them. To be sure, Western democracies still subscribe to the fundamental importance of freedom of expression. Yet entities such as the Council of Europe has issued vague subjective standards for hate speech, which state that with respect to religion, quote, there is no right to offend, that gratuitously offensive speech is not protected, and that within religious freedom, there is a new right of citizens not to be insulted in their religious feelings. And virtually all 47 members of the Council of Europe now have hate speech laws. The last two decades have seen growing numbers of Western prosecutions for negative commentary of Islam under such laws. Prosecutors in Finland, the Netherlands, and Canada have trawled the websites of anti-immigration advocates looking for evidence that Islam's prophet may have been mocked or for some other anti-Islamic comment. I should add Germany to that uh, list too because they have just decided to uh, start uh, looking through internet websites for just such a thing. The Dutch government has taken the added precaution of establishing a, a standing committee on cartoons um, to monitor the reverence treatment of Islam. In France, Canada, Norway, and Italy, publishers, editors, and authors have been tried for inciting religious hostility and insulting religious sensibilities for their critique of Islam and Muslim immigration. In Australia, Austria, Elizabeth Savage Wolf, who had lived in Iran and Libya, was recently convicted and may now face prison for her briefing to an anti-immigration political party, uh, which the verdict of an appeals court described as, quote, putting Islam in an extremely negative light. In Germany, a man was convicted for uh, desecrating or sacrilegious treatment of the word Quran, not the sacred text itself, but the word. Despite Francis Laicite uh, system, uh, which st strictly separates church from state, uh, or religion from politics. The national icon, Bridget Bardot, in her animal rights advocacy, has been convicted and fined five times under hate speech laws for denouncing Islamic slaughter practices, as well as for other derogatory A Helsinki court ruled that an argument made by the defense in a Muslim blasphemy case was inadmissible because, quote, logic and so-called arguments of reason have no true significance in debating religious questions. Um, in Australia, two Christian pastors were convicted at the trial level for criticizing Islam in a class for converted Muslims. Um, and uh, the court there, Judge O'Higgins, uh, stated that they, in pointing out the differences between Christianity and Islam, we're only using the, we're, we're ignoring actually the pro-Islamic versus the Quran. They also said that, the judge also found that Wahhabis are not real Muslims, so that was not a fair example. They were banned, by the way, from the court forever 
uh, citing the Quran again. Um, fortunately, in that case, the charges were eventually dropped on appeal. Although so far there have been few convictions, these laws and the cases they give rise to chill speech and are a measure of the diminishing value placed on society by, uh, on freedom and fairness. And just uh, this week we learned that when the School of Economics has adopted a code uh, saying, a speech code saying that Islam must not be criticized in any context. Why has the West begun to criminalize speech against Islam? Largely, it d does so with the hope of buying, buying social peace. It is fear that is driving this trend. But such laws foster the opposite. They thwart peaceful coexistence by promising a rush to litigation by various religious groups against each other and by empowering radicals by giving them a platform within society. Uh, the US, of course, has the First Amendment, and which gives us strong protections and we have not followed York, Canada, and Australia down this path um, so far. We are one of the only Western nations, certainly the only major Western nation, that does not have either blasphemy or hate speech laws. We do talk in the book, though, a bit about um, two troubling trends. One is uh, self-censorship in some of our major institutions. An example has occurred with the Yale University Press, um, you all remember the uh, definitive work on the Danish cartoon crisis by Yetta Clausen, and in that book, um, she was, uh, Yale decided to suppress the plates of the newspaper with the cartoons, as well as other um, historical and traditional depictions of the Islamic prophet Muhammad. Um, Comedy Central, Walden Books, Random House, and much of the print media. The government all are also self -sense. Um, the government also self-censors. In 2008, Homeland Security and the State Department instructed their employees to avoid using the words um, Salafi, Wahhabist, Caliphate, and Jihadist as offensive to Muslims when they were used by non-Muslims. On, the, on the, the advice of unidentified Muslim consultants, the word liberty was also dropped in favor of the word progress. Uh, in 2009, Homeland Security Secretary dropped Islamic terrorism in favor of man-made disasters. Uh, the two, May 2010 U.S. National Security Strategy docu document, which in previous years had said, quote, the struggle against militant Islamic radicalism is the great ideological conflict of the early years of the 21st century. Um, the next year dropped any reference to Islamic radicalism. Another worrying trend um, that Paul and I have been doing some writing about since the book came out is the decision by the Obama administration to partner with the OIC to implement strategies to stop the neg <coughs> quote, negative stereotyping of Islam. It is jointly sponsored a UN resolution that limits speech and last month, it co-hosted a summit on this topic in Washington, focusing on measures to be applied in the United States. This partnership on the issue of speech with an organization committed to undermining our individu individual freedoms we <coughs> believe should be entered. So why did we undertake this book? What is it about? Paul and I hope that it will help us all see the larger context reframe the debate from ending insult to the result of this movement really is about the enforcement of an Islamic blasphemy regime. We hope that the West will begin to connect the dots between what is developing in the West and what takes place in OIC countries. We hope that Western leaders begin a robust defense of freedom of speech and religion. Thank you. I think, maybe this is my Methodist gospel background, uh, I'll rather than climbing over there and trying to bring all of this stuff over, uh, I'll just stay here, and I promise not to go off into the middle and ask for an altar call. <laughs> I hope I'm not going to be a disappointment to you. Uh, I suspect, you know, the word response and, and so on, is supposed to mean that somehow I'm going to argue with Paul and me. Uh, and I have some reservations and differences of opinion, but I want to start with there isn't much 
really generically where I really disagree with either Paul or Nina and what they've said. You know, and here, you know, and here, and here, uh, Paul gave us a list of people who have been persecuted, people who have suffered, and so on. And a good half of that list are good friends of mine, or people that I know. Or I, as I look at the book, and I see that the foreword is an essay written by Abdurrahman Wahid, the uh, first democratically elected president of Indonesia, uh, was written before he died in the nine. Uh, Abdurrahman Wahid uh, really states very clearly in that preface um, what I think of. I start uh, in, in looking at Abdurrahman Wahid and what we've said. For the starting point, in the scholarly, academic, analytical, and popular community, <coughs> Paul has already, in an earlier book, identified one of the problems for understanding religious extremism, uh, and so on, and that is that much of the framing of the narrative of politics in the last 20 or 30 or 50 years has been, has involved an ignoring of the importance of religion, ignoring the importance of believers. And quite frankly, um, Secular, secularist, liberalist interpretations of contemporary politics, society, and the world that are those those interpretations that are based on old-fashioned modernization theory miss the point. And people like Nina and Paul remind us that religion is an important dimension. Even the great uh, articulators of the theory that said modernization and globalization will inevitably mean the secularization of society. Uh, even people like Peter Berger who articulated that theory have said they were wrong. Religion didn't disappear. Religion, religion didn't just become a matter of personal preference and individual choice and having no role in the public sphere. Tom Farr's program reminds us that the old-fashioned view that religion was simply going to disappear um, was wrong. And, and one of those things, it's nice to have gray hair and be old. Uh, you, you can kind of remind people. When I was a graduate student, I remember there was a big sociology, uh, a big conference organized by the sociologists of religion. And the title of the conference was, What Will Be the Nature of Non-Religious Society? Society without religion, you know, and it's and so we start. We start with we're looking at the same thing, and we recognize that those dynamics are uh, are important. Um, secondly, I want to in this in this kind of a context, a couple of people who were very important to me when I was a graduate student, beginning to do my dissertation research and things like that. Uh, our people, one of them is, gets a good section in, uh, in silence. And that was uh, when I was doing my dissertation in the Sudan. It was at the beginning of the career of Ustaz uh, Mahmoud Muhammad Taha as a teacher of a reformed and revived Islam, an, an Islam reinterpreted. Uh, he was very helpful to me, somebody that I had a great deal of affection for. He was executed for blasphemy in the mid-1980s. But probably a way of saying where I would like to, what shall I say, reshape, reframe, expand Paul and Nina's analysis is that I had a second really good friend there as well, or a second older guy to help me decide my career. Um, I would, I ended up not going into the State Department because of his advice. I ended up not being in the CIA. I ended up being an academic because he helped me recognize that what I really liked to do was to teach and to talk. And it, from his point of view, the State Department and the CIA weren't necessarily those places where I would best be able to do the blabbermouthing that I like to do. Um, but now this guy became then the ambassador to Sudan in the early 1970s, and his name is Cleo Noel. And Cleo was also murdered 
by extremists because of the positions that he took on certain issues. The difference is that Cleo was murdered by black September Palestinians in 1972. Now, the juxtaposition of Ustaz Mahmoud and Ambassador Noel is a way of reminding us that people get murdered for their ideological and faith positions by establishments and radicals who don't like deviation. But those kinds of those kinds of events are not simply the product of Islamic religious fanaticism. Nina, uh, Nina remind uh, Nina and Paul remind us that the last time somebody was actually executed for for blasphemy uh, in the United States was a couple hundred years ago. On the other hand, as Nina all as as we were reminded, in recent years we have an ex uh, a movement back to punishing people for what they say and what they believe. And I think that, again, I would like to like us to be reminded of where we are uh, in, in the broadening nature of the problem that they identify for us. The fundamental problem, and Nina closed with it, the, the fundamental problem is freedom to believe what you want and tell society what you believe. <clears throat> now, in fact, you know, I'm uh, quite happy to uh, be myself. My father was a Methodist minister in rural territories during the agricultural depression in the 1920s and 1930s. He was somebody, he identified himself as a social gospel Christian socialist. Uh, the leading member of his little church in Colfax, Wisconsin, was a banker. And you might imagine that my father had some difficulty. And my father had some difficulty not just with the Colfax banker, but then with the whole structure of the Methodist authorita uh, authoritarian position that could say, uh, that could tell him what he could say and what he couldn't say. And for a while, he left the ministry. Um, my wife and I discovered uh, later you know, when we got married, uh, that neither of our families, had, uh, neither of our uh, families, had ever voted for Frank Franklin Roosevelt. But my dad always voted for Norman Thomas, and her family always voted for Landon and Dewey and that certain and that company. But uh, we are dealing then with an interesting kind of problem, which I would sort of I have my kind of ten ten minutes plus a couple, uh, and I want to close, you know with the kind of subjects that we have, that we deal with, it's, it's a disaster to commit weeks ahead of time to do something. Because in our, in our area, something always happens the day that you're talking. And I would point out, if you, uh, if you didn't get up early enough to have the New York Times with your cup of coffee this morning, uh, you make sure that you read Anthony Shadid's uh, front page article, Tunisia Faces a Balancing Act of Democracy and Religion. And I want to just sort of remind us of this because this article highlights the importance of what I want to add to this very comprehensive kind of discussion. The issue of covering blasphemy, the issue of controlling speech is not tied to a particular definition that says you've got clearly, cleanly good guys. And there is a tendency to have the clearly, cleanly good guys seen as those who are advocating secularism and separation of church and state and separation of religion and politics. And then the bad guys uh, who are uh, wanting to impose their beliefs on society. In the Arab world, there are cases that Nina and Paul remind us of. And it's, it's a very important case. But if cases of people who were destroyed, harassed, imprisoned, made life difficult because of what they believed. But there were more people killed within that framework by or imprisoned 
by the so-called modernizing secularists than there were that were killed by religious extremists. Saddam Hussein is the gift of secular modernization to the Arab world, as was Ben Ali and as was uh, Hosni Mubarak. And in addition to my friend Nasser Abu Zaid, and, and you know, read the whole book, but make sure you read Nasser's essay and Abdurrahman's uh, Abdurrahman Wahid's uh, essay as well. Uh, in addition to Nasser Abu Zaid, who suffered because of what he believed, another person that I enjoyed having the opportunity to meet was an older woman by the name of Zainab El Ghazali. And Zainab El Ghazali was imprisoned because of what she believed. She was tortured because of what she believed. But she was a Muslim brother, sure, or a Muslim sister. Uh, she was preaching her faith in the context of the Nasserite secular modernizing socialism of the 1960s. And so, basically, what we have is this context in which I have no problem with saying that what is going on in Pakistan in terms of the blasphemy laws and what has been going on, uh, what was going on in terms of those laws that executed my, uh, my mentor, uh, Ustaz Mahmoud, I have no problem with that. What I would like to do, however, is to say that this is a case study of a broader issue in which we must be dealing, in which we must be dealing with the punishing prejudices of established orthodoxies, whether that established orthodoxy is French laïcité or Muslim Brotherhood uh, or Muslim Brotherhood uh, extremism or Salafi extremism, and I use the word Salafi. So, just sort of as we look at Tunisia, just kind of closing. Again, nice to be gray-haired. I can remember lots of old happenings in the early 1960s. The then authoritarian ruler of Tunisia, Habib Bourguiba, decided that Ramadan was useless in society. And that he said, we should postpone, we should postpone fasting in Ramadan until the country is fully developed, so don't do Ramadan. And the year after he had made that announcement, I had the pleasure of being in Tunisia. And even my communist student friends at that point, made sure that they didn't eat, drink, or smoke in public. Now, chain smokers, chain smoker fellow graduate students couldn't find, uh, it could, it could find it in their heart to be Ramadan at least publicly. So I would suggest that we have a really grave problem that Paul and Nina have helped us to identify. I would suggest, however, that the solution is not simply in fighting against the OIC, it's not simply in fighting against uh, the Salafis, it is involved in the broader problem of trying to reduce the ability of established orthodoxies and political establishments to suppress any kind of dissent. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Do we have a microphone for the do we have a microphone for the audience to use as we ask our questions? Okay. I'm just gonna speak loud. Uh, we're gonna turn to the audience in just a moment, but uh, if we do an ask Nina and all to respond if they like to what John has said, and ask them also to begin to introduce uh, into the discussion a little bit about American foreign policy uh, in the following way. If it is in our interest, as I think it is, you're free to disagree, for the democracies, the struggling democracies of the Arab Spring, of Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, to succeed, if it is in our interest for them to succeed as democracies per se, 
what's the role, you touched on this a little bit, but I'd like to hear a little more. What's the role of anti-blasphemy laws and practices and anti-apostasy in the success of democracy? But first, please, uh, Nina, perhaps you would like to respond first. Um, yeah, and you're right, John, I, I, I haven't seen the New York Times today yet. <laughs> and that is exactly the, the issue of balancing in these Arab revolutions uh, freedom of religion, which has been suppressed by the secular, uh, modernizing secularists in Iraq and, um, and throughout the, uh, the Arab world. Um, but, you know, one thing that has caught our eye is the lack of seriousness of understanding by the media and by our own um, diplomats to some extent when they talk about the threat um, that is now facing uh, say Egypt uh, from the Muslim Brotherhood and they always talk about it in terms of alcohol, the right to wear bikinis, um, the right to go to movies, certainly this preoccupies the journalists writing these stories. Uh, but there's something much more of concern and that is whether there will be uh, now uh, speech repression and uh, repression of ideas, um, imprisoning uh, the populations anew in a dogmatic ideological chamber. And there was a, a, a worrisome case that's already popped up, and that is uh, Sawahiri's, the um, uh, Christian Coptic uh, businessman in Egypt, also in a running for office, uh, tweeted a Mickey and Minnie Mouse cartoon wearing Islamic garb, and he is now facing trial for blasphemy in Egypt. Um, and uh, I, I think that uh, we may see some crossfire in, in these legal actions. Uh, Kurt Bernthmiller, who is on our staff, a fellow here, who's here, a research fellow who's uh, with the Hudson Institute Center for Religious Freedom, who's here in this room, just wrote a piece um, about Sand Monkey, a uh, blogger, uh, now suing the Salafis for, um, uh, we don't quite know what yet, and we hope it's not um, insult, religious insult. Um, he's, he's, uh, and, and I think it's gonna, it's gonna try to make a case of incitement to violence, which is completely different than incitement to hatred, which does not require a deed. So anyhow, we're looking at these um, issues very closely to see whether the Muslim Brotherhood in this part of the world is going to recognize religious freedom for all, not just their own group, and um, and whether they are going to allow freedom of speech. Because if they don't, it will be uh, a rapid downward spiral for the other freedoms, as we have seen in Pakistan and the other countries we've analyzed. I also want to make the point that we are not in favor of blasphemy, um, and we see recognize the right of um, uh, of uh, religious groups, of all religious groups, to um, have uh, orthodox beliefs and to um, declare something as being uh, an, a, 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 a blasphemous. Um, it's the pairing of that with uh, punishments, whether administered by vigilantes um, or by the state that we object to. Um, and my the final point is that um, other ideas do inspire uh, similar kinds of violence, and um, we don't deny that. We talk about that on page 237, um, some of the other applications of speech restrictions as well. Um, we're opposed to that. We're free speech purists. Um, and, um, you know, there was an incident in this city with um, a man, James Lee, 2010 was inspired by um, um, Al Gore's book, Al Gore's video on the environment, um, and took the Discovery Channel hostage and was finally shot dead after a couple hours standoff. So, I mean, there's other um, uh, incidents of uh, speech restrictions all over the place, and we oppose them all. And we do not see um, 
suppression of Al Gore's film, and you want to see the suppression of um, some of these other uh, things that we talk about in the book <coughs> as being the solution. cooperation. And I'll just say very briefly that the OIC has taken a position against free speech um, for punishments, for uh, universal punishments, a universal blasphemy law, if you will, um, to uh, prevent is something called Islamophobia, which it does not define. There's no common standard for that. Um, and defamation of religion. And uh, to its credit, in the UN, the Obama administration has, in recent years, decided uh, in, in the last couple of years to move away from its initial reaction, which was to jointly do a resolution calling for um, punishments of, uh, uh, of defamation and um, or hate speech, and is now uh, calling for dealing uh, with. Uh, feelings of insult, of religious insult, on the part of Muslims and others with more speech, that is, uh, protest or um, trying to promote um, more civic discourse, um, which I have written I'm in favor of. However, they took it to another step, which I'm very critical of, and that is to invite the OIC to come to Washington, hold a conference, uh, to discuss how to implement this. Now, there was never any meeting in the minds between the OIC and the US, and so what happened is that the OIC immediately seized on this opportunity to start, again, talking about how to enforce uh, a law, a ban of defamation of Islam. So I think that was a mistake. I think it was a mistake to hold it in the United States because the United States became exhibit A in Islamophobia. And our Justice Department officials went on the stand. They were in the dock in a way in this conference that took place in December with the OIC and saying that how um, we deal with bigotry here and that we arrest this person and that person. And that's fine. They, they're, it's true. But um, they failed to give um, the larger picture of how the United States is a, an extremely religious society, number one, an extremely pluralistic society and um, how we overall have dealt with this problem fairly well. Yes, throughout our history, we've had um, bigotry and problems that we still do. Um, however, to take it out of context, to have the United States being the only one in a room full where Saudi Arabia diplomats, Pakistani diplomats are sitting there taking notes as if this is a huge propaganda victory for them and a windfall, um, was just, I think, the wrong approach. Um, thank you. Um, should mention that I, I thank Tom, Tim, and Kyle. I should um, uh, also thank Professor Val for, for being willing to be a, a respondent here. Um, uh, just a, a brief response to some of his comments, which are in form like his. They're more a gloss on what he said than, than a disagreement. Um, Two things. One, one is I, I think it's correct that the, the secular rulers, um, people like Saddam Hussein or Mubarak, um, have been, in terms of killing people, have killed more than uh, some sort of radical Islamists. That um, secularism per se is no solution to anything. The world's most religiously. Uh, the regime most repressive of religious freedom in the world is probably North Korea, which is also the most secular regime, unless you count worship of the uh, Kim Jong-il and others as a religion, which it, it is, but it's officially atheist. And, you know, secularism, this America and India have a similar definition of secularism. Um, 
then you have France and the ECT, you have uh, Turkey, at least under the sort of Ataturk type of regime, more repressive, and then you have the remaining communist countries. So uh, repression in the name of secular commitments is also widespread. There are problems um, all over. So I would also add that, again, there's repression, so there's repression of dissent there. The, um, in Europe, other things too are forbidden. We've seen um, in France in recent weeks a, a law passed saying that you cannot deny the Armenian genocide. Um, someone was uh, fined for anti-Semitic remarks. Then um, they, there are denial of Holocaust laws. So there are other things. And in fact, in Poland, uh, two weeks ago, very unusual and and an actual anti-Christian blasphemy case where a pop singer was in fact fined 5,000 euros. So the, there are other examples, and we, we list several of these in the book. Um, but the number, as far as I can tell, is small. It's in the dozens. Um, as distinct from the phenomena we're talking about where it, it's in the many thousands. So uh, I, I agree. You know, every Nina mentioned environmentalism. Um, any form of orthodoxy uh, can develop a form of, of repression and repress dissenting ideas. Um, but one reason we want to focus on this one is that I think it's, it's the most uh, widespread and perhaps because it's growing. And my worry is that um, Western powers are sort of adding to existing problems by moving in this direction themselves. Okay, very good. Let's go to the audience and uh, if you would raise your hand, we've got a mic for you. And I'll ask you to identify <coughs> yourself and ask your question. Um, my name is Cody Smart. I'm a PhD student at George Mason. And um, I actually have two quick questions, if that's okay. The first is uh, to talk about the Irish blasphemy law, the first Western country to institute a blasphemy law, and kind of how um, some Islamic countries are using that as a, um, you know, see, the West is doing it, so so we can do it too. Um, and, and then the second question is, is it seems to me there, there is a difference between um, religious speech law and, and say, like, um, communism or, or um, how it things, because in religion, it's, it's where, not only is violence justified to them, it's actually you're getting an extra crown or an extra virgin in heaven, right? That's, that's the whole point. Is you're actually, with, with religion, doing this is not just justified, but a moral action. It seems to me one of the best things that we can do to fight against this type of bigotry is to quit putting religion on the pedestal. You know, if you don't have a right to not be a hindu. Um, Sorry. The um, uh, in, in terms of, I, I'm not sure I followed your distinction between sort of religious and secular justifications in terms of reward. I remember when I was in graduate school reading Franz Fanon, which said violence, the killing of the settler does, it sort of makes two men, it sort of destroys the other, and the act of violence by you yourself affirms you. Uh, you can get similar writing to Sartre and others are getting kind of riffs off that. So there's enough uh, secular defense of uh, the morality of violence uh, around. You get that Nazi tongue and others. So um, I guess I wouldn't buy that particular uh, distinction. So you can get the problems out of the school. Okay, question back here. Um, can I just say something about sure, oh, sure. Uh, when you no. read the Council of Europe papers about why they have religious hate speech when they recommend it, and they don't recommend blasphemy laws, they recommend, uh, and Ireland is sort of out of step, it's adopting a blasphemy law instead of uh, hate speech laws, um, but they're doing it um, um, th quite cynically, and they're doing it to, uh, not because they want to put religion on a pedestal, but they actually say we need to placate um, some of our uh, some of our re religious minorities who take their religion so seriously that they're willing to use violence. So again, it's clearly fear rather than uh, uh, an embrace of religion that is driving the West to take this route. And just 
quickly as well. I think that we've got two extremes, putting religion on a pedestal. I think it's a very important thing analytically. But it's also true that when you look at, say, sociologist of religion like uh, Rodney Stark, uh, uh, in, in his book, uh, One True God, he simply says, you know, it is sufficient to recognize that religious intolerance is inherent in all monotheisms. Now, one, I think that what we need to do is to avoid putting religion on a pedestal, but I think we also avoid need to avoid categorically demonizing religion as the cause of violence. Okay. Uh, my name is Donald Barnes, currently associated with Guangxi University in China. Uh, thank you, first of all, for your comments. I think you uh, do a very fine job of highlighting uh, issues by lots of evidence, and uh, that's hard. No, no one can deny the real data, which I commend you for. My question would be ask you to take a historical view of the current situation and inform me and perhaps others as well as to where are we in terms of a of the, of the uh, movement of things in the course of history. You can look at the history of uh, Christianity, for example, and go back to the period of the Inquisition and uh, uh, the New England and so on and so forth, or the times of, uh, of trying to circle the wagons and defend the, the faith against the uh, infidels. Are we in a similar position in terms of Islam today and were there, was there a period of time in the history of Islam where they were much more open to ideas and interactions with <coughs> other uh, parts of the world and other thoughts? And would such a, a, is there a swing of the pendulum that we're seeing here, and that that pendulum might again swing in the other direction? John, do you want to? I'm going to have to leave exactly at 10.30. <coughs> because I'm working on answering this question. I have a course called Muslim Christian Relations in World History. And at 11 o'clock, we are going to be discussing a debate between Patriarch Timothy I and the Islamic Caliph al-Mahdi at the beginning of the ninth century. And at that point, and I, one of the things we're going to be trying to ask is, why was it possible for a patriarch and the Caliph to argue about the Trinity and to tell each other essentially, you're wrong, you're going to hell and all of that, and they could do it with smiles on their face and they could say thank you for coming and so on. Uh, I think that there are, we've got, the, what you're saying is, is is there is a swing and it depends upon the context. Um, there has always been both dimensions. The dimension of condemnation, John of Damascus in the 8th century, uh, essentially calling, uh, calling Islam a Christian heresy that needs to be blotted out, uh, or uh, Timothy, who has respect for the Prophet Muhammad, and so on. Uh, so that these two, these two alternatives have always existed, and uh, it becomes, in the, uh, from my point of view, how do we encourage the the dialogue and discourage the punishment? Yeah, uh, you know, one thing that's uh, different is the globalization of our communications and our world, and uh, so. We're seeing for the first time, after 200 years of constitution here, uh, guaranteeing individual rights and freedoms, um, which is also guaranteed by the UN since its founding, um, uh, uh, this demand from the uh, Muslim world and, and in a sort of monitoring by the Muslim world of what is said about Islam here. And that is something very new. So uh, that's what we address in this book. But this is, is we're going from a position where really the, the traditional position was that what non-Muslim authorities did within their borders regarding non-Muslims was not the business of the uh, of Sharia and the Sharia courts. And now that is um, that is changing. Yeah, the um, couple of comments, as John said. Wasn't Timothy actually in the, in the employee of the Caliph at the time? No, yeah, John, John was. Okay. John, uh, John at Damascus was an employee, was a high-level clerk. Yeah. So, but just to second that, people, um, well, you know, 1,000 years ago, maybe not 500 or 600, but 1,000 years ago, were usually able to argue. Um, uh, 
and you know the idea was well of course a Christian's going to disagree with you and, and think Muhammad is not a prophet you know because they're a Christian that's what so the, these those things were understood um, another point there was just a mention of say the Inquisition or events in New England um, just add the point I don't think it's too picky these were not against infidels these were against people within the house the question of the heretic and the apostate uh, usually there are you know, many more punishments and are directed them the people who are outside the fold are sort of less of concern but the ones inside creating problems so um, your know, punishments for heresy and apostasy um, with a focus rather than what happens to those people out there. That's just the sign. But um, in terms, so you know, things change throughout history. Obviously, uh, I think what we're seeing now, at least in the context of let's just take one century at a short period, um, we're seeing now a, an increase in these sort of blasphemy restrictions, and I think the rate of violence in the Muslim world, so there's, there's a sort of worsening over a period of decades. The, some of that's replaced with nationalism by Islamism, and um, this sort of um, move in the West to um, so reintroduce blasphemy or quasi-blasphemy laws when they had been defunct largely for 40 or 50 years. Um, so there's an intent in more recent history. There's an intensification on both scores. Uh, hi, good morning. Um, I'm Diane Shah from Duke University. I'm a PhD student there. Um, I have a question. Uh, I have a question more for Nina, uh, but Paul and uh, Professor Ball, you feel free to respond. So, Nina, you talked a lot about restrictions on free speech that is deemed um, as a defamation to Islam or um, free speech that is seen as promoting um, Islamophobia. Um, and usually these restrictions are justified on the uh, basis of maintaining public order or to, to respect a certain religion, um, Islam in particular. I was wondering um, how you compare this to, um, for example, restrictions on free speech, um, uh, like the denial of Holocaust, especially in Europe. Um, I think in most Muslim countries, at least for, from um, the country where I come from, Malaysia, the rhetoric has been um, that you know the West is doing this with regards to um, speech denying the Holocaust, but we can't do this with regards to speech um, on defamation of Islam. So I was wondering what you think of that. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's on page 237 of our book where we uh, also criticize the Holocaust denial laws. We're against those as well. Um, we, the United States, of course, does not have Holocaust denial laws. Um, they're in Europe, they're in France. I think it was uh, some fashion designer was most recently um, uh, convicted for saying anti-Semitic anti slur in a bar while he was drunk. Um, it, it seems very foreign to our ears here in the United States to hear about incidents like that. Um, there is um, uh, a limit, though, to the damage that Holocaust denial laws can do. They're not a body of ideas. It's a fact of whether there was a Holocaust or not, and the same with the Armenian Holocaust. Again, we're against the, all of these restrictions, but with Islam, because it is a very a full religious, fully developed religion, it has lots of ideas. And when you ban negative analysis or critique um, or casting it in a negative light, as the Austrian Court of Appeals recently said, um, you're taking off the table um, just, uh, just uh, um, most of what's important about human civilization, um, all sorts of ideas. And if you expand that to other religions, like they seem to be doing in Poland or other countries, um, you're taking even more ideas off the table. And um, India just recently, uh, this week, um, started monitoring the internet and Facebook for um, both anti-Islamic rhetoric and anti-Hindu rhetoric. So the, the space of uh, politically correct speech is just getting narrower and narrower. 
and that's a, a, a big concern. <coughs> My name is uh, Megan Paul. I'm a student at American University. And um, my question is, when it comes to the blasphemy and um, apostasy laws and punishments in, uh, say, Saudi Arabia or Pakistan or Iran, Iraq, uh, what are the chances of those punishments and laws being updated to be more, not so much modernized, but more, um, I guess, lenient towards the idea of uh, freedom of speech and opinion. Is there any hope of that happening? It, uh, it depends on the country um, and, and, and the group. You know, Saudi Arabia is much tougher, particularly with their coming succession. We seem to be moving into a more restrictive phase. Um, but um, with uh, Somewhere like Iran, um, who knows? Does it appear to be a large proportion of the population is opposed to its regime? So things may change. Uh, with a country like uh, uh, with a country like Indonesia, uh, the possibilities may be there. With Malaysia, uh, they may be there. It depends how these debates go. Um, but yeah, one of the things you want to emphasize is that sort of um, one reason we focus on this is. You know, the ability to discuss the issue itself and other issues is key. So we need to keep pushing on that. So in, in different parts of the Muslim world, um, you know, things may well develop in, in different directions. So may I just add one thing? This isn't response to your question, but I've got the microphone. The um, uh, one thing to emphasize, to emphasize which um, is that you know, one of the things of about these laws is they often do, you know, fail to achieve their ends. If the end is social peace, you know, and studies by, by Brian Grimm and Roger Finke um, uh, point out that not only these restrictions, but, but other ones as well, tend to lead to animosity and religious violence. And uh, similarly in the West, uh, the, it is not notable that the countries which restrict speech are more harmonious. Uh, to quote uh, Rowan Atkinson, uh, Blackadder, Mr. Bean, and so on, would be very articulate on this score. He says, um, they don't change people's minds. He says, they just put a cover on a snake pit of ideas, which, you know, to mix the metaphor with faster even more. to public discussion of uh, the blasphemy and apostasy laws, um, e even in Western countries, a lot of times people are less tolerant of the, just the very discussion of it. Do you have any opinions on that? On whether or not that will change? Sorry, you just said it again. In uh, not just the countries that I listed earlier, but some and some Western countries as well, the very discussion of um, of blasphemy laws and freedom of speech, and even just discussing the possibility of Islamophobia, um, a lot of countries are against even just the public discussion of, of it. Is there any I guess hope of that changing? There's always hope. I'm not sure you mean about not discussing Islamophobia. Well, or not discussing Islam because it may be accused of being Islamophobic. Yeah, that's I'm sorry. Oh. That, yeah. Okay. Um, is that so um, yeah, I think that possibility is there. Would you repeat the question? Okay, the the, the question is uh, looking at Western countries where people are very reluctant to discuss things Islamic or things reputedly Islamic because of accused of being anti-Islamic or Islamophobic or whatever. Um, so there's a repression of discussion. Um, the, can that change? Uh, yes. Um, the Europeans are, tend to be moving in a more restrictive dimension, um, but uh, 
you know, there's real debate about that. In England, um, there was a move towards a blasphemy law. The blasphemy law protected only the Church of England. We have not even the Methodists. Right. <laughs> the, and um, there was a move then to apply it to all religions. And the counter was, no, drop the thing entirely. And uh, there was a sort of very good debate, especially in the House of Lords. And they didn't, they've got a problematic other laws, but they didn't get a blasphemy law. They, they had another one which is sort of so complex and weak, it's unlikely to do that. So, you know, when it came up for a discussion, uh, that was pushed back. In Australia, case we mentioned, um, the ultimate failure of that case uh, has probably stopped this move in Australia. Uh, because the Muslims who brought the original complaint said afterwards, you know, says, now when we have a seminar, the place is full of Christians taking notes about anything we might say about Christianity. And what happens is the law has put people at odds with each other, you know, watching their every word. And says, if it's to ensure social peace, it doesn't. Uh, similarly, in Canada, a couple of cases before the Human Rights Commissions, again, tended to collapse under their own weight and make the whole idea ridiculous that have human rights commissions asking journalists what they were thinking when they wrote something. So um, I think critique and exposure, as particularly the fact that you know these laws don't work. Um, you know, Norway has quite stringent sort of anti-hate speech laws. It doesn't stop Bremen from going out and killing you know 76 people because of his views on Islam. Mm -hmm. So um, I think the change can be there, but uh, I think we need to push persistently and strongly in favor of free speech. They, um, these restrictions um, create more problems than they solve. Just a quick, Paul uh, distinguished when he did his presentation between state level activities and societal vigilante kind of activities. Uh, and he was talking about the negative dimensions. I think it's also true, though, that there are, that, that same distinction is involved on the positive side. Uh, and I think that state is is behind, in, in a place like the United States, the state is behind uh, the popular societal. Uh, that my experience, maybe it's just, the, maybe it's they self-select somebody that they think is going to be a good guy or whatever. Uh, but my experience, uh, last, last Sunday, I was at, uh, an Episcopalian parish out on the eastern shore. Uh, and the question that they had asked me to talk about, uh, the Muslim world and the West, uh, closer together or farther apart. Um, my experience is that most people, when they are coming to meetings talking about these things, are much more open to a free discussion than people who are running for political office are. Yeah, um, unfortunately, I, I think that it, the trend in Europe, uh, leaving Great Britain aside, and even that's a big question, and by the way, we have in our book, we try to summarize that House of Lords debate on the expanding the blasphemy law, which they ultimately decided not to do. It, 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 it has, some, has all the main arguments. It was a great elevated debate. Um, but I think that the trend in Europe is to continue this and maybe to expand it to other bodies of ideas, like I said, Christianity. Um, uh, and there is, you know, uh, I, I think some Ameri common Americans are grappling with this too. And when you see the crisis situation, this pastor in Florida, Terry Jones, burning a Koran, American troops in Afghanistan at risk um, because of it, uh, there was there were voices that surprised me. Uh, a, a Supreme Court Justice Breyer, um, a Senator who, who later retracted, um, Senator Leslie Grant. Who later reinforced his statements and got in deeper, saying that we should have a ban on Koran burning. Now, it sounds easy, it sounds innocuous, sounds clean and neat, but that's not going to satisfy um, the demand. Uh, it's, it goes way beyond that, as we, we said today, and, and say, uh, document in our book. So um, I think that the West is still very much scratching its head and trying to figure out, um, uh, well, the US, what to do about this. That was also the impulse of the Obama administration when they came in um, to go along with the OIC on this. They've now pulled back a bit, but they still want to, to, to act like there's common ground here, when in fact there is no common ground on this issue. 
and I'm not opposed to, we're not opposed to the OIC, working with the OIC on other issues, on, on aid, humanitarian aid, or, or, or other issues, but there is no common ground on this issue right now. Um, but I think that, um, and the thought that I'd like to leave you with is that, that it's important that we learn uh, that there be a, a, a civic discourse, a respectful civic discourse within our democracies. And the big challenge is how you do this, how does the government foster this without treading on fundamental bedrock freedom? Well, I think that's a nice way to end this. Uh, I want to thank you again for coming. Join me in thanking our panelists. Let me remind you that, or tell you, that we have copies of the book for sale at a reduced price, I understand, in the office across the hall as you leave. And also, please uh, take a look at our website on the Religious Freedom Project website. You'll see a number of upcoming events. Uh, we hope to welcome you to those events as well. So thank you for coming.